the big one has arrived. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. This one needs no introduction. The Reverse Silverburst Adam Jones Flying V with the headstock that has to be covered over. Yeah, that's what it looks like. So let's go ahead and get this puppy out and just get my first impressions. First off, I remember they were billing these as like the heaviest guitars ever, at least the one that they built for Adam. But this thing is incredibly lightweight. The dealer was telling me it's just a little over seven pounds, which I was kind of shocked by. I thought that was a spec on these that they were supposed to be ridiculously heavy. But this is my first time seeing reverse silver burst in person. I think the first time I saw this color used was there was a Japan exclusive run of customs. So that was a more familiar model to find silver burst on. Why is it called reverse silver burst? Well, here's what silver burst normally looks like. If you inverse it, you've got the silver on the edges in the ebony center. The top I'm not all that in love with, but I do like the effect on the neck and the sides and the back of the body. It works a little bit better in my opinion. So it seems like Adam just wanted something incredibly different. But after the popularity of his initial age signed Les Paul Custom, his VOS one, the VOS number two, his Gibson USA Les Paul Standard, I mean, we've been getting Adam Jones out the wazoo. But they decided to really space this one out. Like it's been a good two years since this thing was first teased and he was using one on the stage. So what is the story here? They decided to make 50 of these and it was advertised as a collector's edition run which means ridiculous price tag this was twenty thousand dollars <laughs> is there anything on this that like really makes it super special to be worth that price tag i'll be honest with you no it's a, a collector's bragging piece had they had made more than 50 i'm not sure these would have sold when they officially launched you could really only find them on the gibson website so i assumed most dealers had already pre-sold these years in advance typically with a big release like this you see them hit reverb right away because the dealers want to move their inventory but i did not see that with this one I literally only saw two. So if you want to know a cool trick, if you go to Gibson's website and if you try to add more to your cart than they have available, that's how you can tell how many Gibson had. So I did that two hours after their launch and I could see they had at least 16 to begin with. And then by the time I thought to check the international market, there were only four of them on their website. So with seeing that many just on Gibson's website, I was curious how fast these would sell out. Because at first I wasn't necessarily sold on this, but it was FOMO that made me buy one because I was shocked within 36 hours, that's a day and a half, the stock was depleted down to one. Now, was it officially sold out that afternoon? Not exactly. Sometimes I think it's people's credit cards are being denied or there were fraudulent purchases. So occasionally they do still pop up in stock on Gibson's website. It might be that they hadn't created all 50. So at the bare minimum, it seems Gibson sold half of these direct and then the other ones went to like the very top dealers. For example, I got this one from Wildwood Guitars and I know Sweetwater at least had one or two. The Gibson Garage got one and a few other overseas dealers like Toman. I remember seeing at least one or two there. But now we need to talk about the freaky headstock thing. A lot of people are quick to point out that this looks like a Dean product. And at first glance, yeah, you might be right, but you have to understand history. Gibson used this headstock back in 1957. You would see it used on the prototype version of the Explorer known as the Futura. So technically Dean probably copied them when they created their Fort headstock design. It's just not Gibson's most heavily used headstock for obvious reasons. <laughs> but you could find this on some Gibson Moderns that were produced in the 2010s-ish era. So it isn't completely unused, but besides the finish and the headstock, the next thing that's grabbing people's attention is what is with this toggle switch down here. It reminds me when the mad lad Zach Wilde was part of Gibson's family. His V's had it in a similar position. Now, is it the most comfortable? Yeah, you can kind of get it with your arm if you want. I mean, that can be kind of cool depending on what you're trying to do. It also gives you a very interesting location for your back plate there. I'm really digging that in person because that has like a golden reflection to it. It matches perfectly with the aged reverse silver burst color. These were billed as lightly aged Murphy Lab. So you've got finish checking all around this thing. It's just nothing excessive. I'll be honest, I thought it kind of looked like crap in photos. Not their best work, but in person, with the way the silver paint dances in the light, it honestly looks pretty darn good. You kind of have to appreciate it more so in person than photos are going to suggest. 
It does look like they try to put some picking wear there. Maybe they're trying to mimic what his looked like after a couple of years of being on the road. Now, as far as the pickups, it looks like it's going to be the same set that was in his Les Paul Custom. And besides our toggle switch being in a unique location, we kind of have the modified Les Paul style knobs. Normally you don't have that on a flying V, but it gives you more control and gives Adam something he's more so akin to. And instead of having a giant gaudy V logo here, it's just string through ferals. And I'm happy to see that they have the posi locks on the vintage correct way this time. But Adam really likes his artwork. We saw that on all of his Epiphone Les Paul customs. I was quite intrigued when he decided to put that on the truss rod cover of this one. I kind of like it. It's like a two-headed dog thing. But for $20,000, besides just the guitar, you get this case. Not gonna lie, really, really, really incredibly let down that this is the case for this thing. It's just one of their new protector style ones. It's not even exclusive to this guitar. You can actually buy these for any Flying V out there. And keep in mind, the Les Paul had a nice black interior one. But on the exterior, we had, you know, Adam Jones 1979. Sure, TKL had a lot of issues with the silver burst paint sticking and not being that good. But it made those feel special and those were at half the price. But to be fair, it's reminiscent of the 80s era, which is kind of what this is trying to encapsulate. But how about the case candy? We get a cool limited edition strap, which has a pin of that dog wolf design thing, which is actually pretty cool. It's secured in this manner. Oh, and check this out. That's a giant rubber band. I've never seen one like that. <laughs> and we've got our case keys, pre-packed checklist, Gibson custom tag, COA booklet with our little doggies again, but oh, this really feels cheap. It feels like a cardboard type thing where sometimes we get like bound leather. Maybe that was something the artist specifically wanted. Pretty sure this is our culprit right here. It dinged up into the dog's nose and then that little jut right there got the other area. It lines up perfect. And you can see where it's all dinged up on the edges too. I just haven't had good luck on Case Candy lately. The last mishap was the Richie Faulkner flying V. Let's see what the inside's like. Oh wow, that went all the way through the spine. All right, we're redeeming ourselves a little bit here. We've got a little photo of Adam playing one of his, and it is signed. So the guitar is not signed, but the COA is. Why is that? It's a lot easier to ship Adam 50 of these than ship 50 guitars to him or have him come in. And here's a cool Easter egg that they're not advertising. Apparently, 18 of the 50 have a custom art doodle on the back of that photo. So if you happen to have purchased one of these, take that out of the booklet and you might be met with a surprise like this viewer of the show. The only place I have confirmation of that is from Matt's Guitar Shop Facebook post because they just happened to get one of those. And it appears this one was numbered one out of 18. I can't wait for more photos to show up to see all the unique designs. I happen to get number 35. Now the big question is, this is labeled as collector's edition. Will they do a Gibson USA or Epiphone run? I don't know on this one. I could maybe see the Epiphone run, but Gibson USA or a regular custom shop, I doubt it. But we do have one last piece of case candy. I was shocked to see this. They do give you a doofy little pick guard. It kind of ruins the vibe of the reverse silver burst because you just don't see it enough on the edge. This is one of those few times where I think pick guard off is definitely the way to go. Kind of seems strange they went through the trouble of manufacturing a unique pick guard that most people would probably never even put on. But they're even nice enough to give you the screws. So to learn more about this one, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs to judge it on its own merits. Let's just forget about all the hype and hate on the internet and the price tag. Let's just see, is it a good guitar in and of itself? Inside the Adam Jones V, let's go ahead and take a look at these pickups. We do have a little bit of aging to them. Not a lot of patina, but just enough to make it look worn in. Here's what the backside looks like. This is a reverse mounted custom bucker. Adam just prefers his pull pieces down here rather than the traditional positioning like so. Here's what that neck pickup cavity looks like. It's a long neck tenon. Then on the bridge, we have a Duncan distortion, the DDJ model. You can tell they aged it just a tad towards the top to make it look like strings have been resting against it. But hey, that's surprising. We actually have the Seymour Duncan branding on it. That was one of the special things about the first age signed Les Paul custom of his. The Big Mac Daddy $10,000 version didn't have the Seymour Duncan branding on it. But to be fair, they were recreating a guitar that he's used a long time with this run. Whereas that's not necessarily the case this time. But I thought this was pretty cool. It looks like it's actually signed by Juarez, the famous winder within Seymour Duncan. Then they have some sort of a serial number system. I'm not entirely too sure. Maybe somebody who's more familiar with their stuff can fill us in in the comments. There's our DDJ and a look inside of our bridge pickup cavity. 
Now that we understand that, let's get our readings. 16.19 in the bridge position, the neck is 7.95, and the middle just for fun, 5.33. So a unique spec that we did not touch upon on here is the fact that this actually does have a maple top despite not being able to see it and they decided to go ahead and make it three pieces. Now why on earth am I paying $20,000 for a three piece top? It's because that's what Adam likes. Again we'll hop on over to this guy. On these they actually put a finish check line mimicking how lacquer sinks into three piece tops occasionally to make it look like this has the three piece top. It does have it, it's just not the exact lining up of it. But they must have made the decision that putting the seam line on these ones probably wouldn't look that good. But it's just kind of one of those quirky little specs that it's a nice attention to detail thing. They were trying to make this as 1979 as it could have been if it was produced. So we'll just have to take their word that that's there. Because typically a 58 Flying V does not have a maple top. It's just straight up mahogany. But that doesn't mean that there's other runs out there. You might really enjoy this cool blue quilt top version with a TV white back. Moving on to our bridge, it's not surprising that he went for the Nashville style because, again, that's what would have been used on his Les Paul Custom, although PW branded. And then we already talked about how we don't have a big flashy V. They're probably once again trying to show off the full extent of the reverse burst finish, which I agree with. We just got these little ferrules running through. So now let's talk about the control layout again. So usually the 58 style looks like this. So you'd have one like here, 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 and then you've got your output jack over there. I did not show you the output jack earlier. It's kind of like the Richie Faulkner flying V that we had just documented, or like the Dave Mustaine flying V. They put it in the corner over here, then they use a Stratocaster style output jack. But what is different is how they routed this. If I remember correctly, the other ones just had like a very shallow channel route, but this goes all the way through to our toggle switch, so it's its own little cavity here. You can see where it ends right there. In fact, you can even see one of the screws holding that medallion coming through the body there. And I was kind of shocked to not see the usual Gibson braided wiring. We've just got a black and yellow wire. And then instead of our toggle switch also being over in this land, it's over on its own thing. And now we have the Les Paul layout of two volumes, two tones. And we're utilizing speed knobs that have the pointers on them in all locations. Now we'll just take a second to appreciate the finish checking, so I feel this lighting kind of helps show it off. Now, since this is lightly aged, they also look like they put the VOS treatment on top of it. So all that gunk slash swirls and fingerprints, that is meant to be there. It's kind of like a buffing compound, but they leave it on there. It's to make the guitar look a little bit worn in, so it's not so hyper glossy. You either love it or you hate it. Personally, I'm never that big of a fan, but it is what it is. You have to accept it on these artist models because there's only one version of this one out there. And here we can see our seven ply binding on the top, just like a Les Paul Custom. Then you will see we have a strap button right here, kind of towards the bottom of the base side horn. And then on the shoulder over here, they're utilizing the posi lock straps. They reissue of a part that Gibson used very briefly in the early 80s. How do you tell the difference between this and a vintage original? The vintage originals have a diamond cut pattern on the bottom to help them grip into the guitar. It's basically a vintage style of strap lock, and why I made a big deal of putting this on the historically correct way is the Les Pauls came stock like this, so it actually wasn't doing anything but helping it fall off. I think they were just trying to make people see that, oh yes, it is the diamond style from the front, because if on properly, it doesn't follow the slit of your strap so it stays on better, but you don't necessarily see it from the front. So far my opinion of it in this location is not very good. It's hard to get your strap on it because there's not a lot of room to work with in this shoulder. Moving on from our maple top mahogany body, we've got the neck with the ebony fretboard. This fretboard looks phenomenal. Now I do have this sneaking suspicion that Wildwood might have conditioned this one for me before it was sent to me. But I also want to mention these mother of pearl inlays look absolutely fantastic. They have a little bit more movement to them than sometimes you'll find. So that's just kind of luck of the draw. I doubt that they were doing anything particularly specific with the mother of pearl. Here's another unique thing about them. It has fret nibs. Adam's previous models in the custom shop did not have that. Likely because his was actually refretted. Again, it just comes down to are they recreating something versus a new idea. 
I would say this fret wire seems a little bit smaller. This is what Gibson described it as on their website. And it's got all the usual 12 inch fretboard radius and 24 3 quarter inch scale length. We have a bone nut that measures 1.68 inches, which increases to 2.03 at the 12th. There's fret neck depth 0.87 and 0.94 by the 12th. So it's not a huge neck by any means. Here's what that neck looks like at the first fret and the 12th fret. It does get a little bit wider the farther up you go. The website calls it a medium C neck shape profile. I'd say it's comfy. Now our crazy headstock. I was not a fan of this when I first saw it. I've never liked this headstock style in general, but when you hold this and play it, you view it at such an angle, it nearly looks just like a regular flying V headstock. It's not as crazy as it looks in photos, will be my final say on that. But we've got our gaudy Gibson logo that does stick up proud. It's just like what you'd find on a 50s era flying V. And then here you can see the truss rod. Everything's in good shape on this one. And here's that cover we were looking at earlier. So that design behind the dogs is actually familiar. That's what they put on the backside of the headstock of the Epiphone versions. So it's cool to see that come back. And then the official name of this artwork is Dog Days. I like it. It matches his theme, but it's not too crazy. But it's just a regular truss rod cover. It's not like made of metal or anything. They did age the edges of the headstock just a tad. Give you your first couple of dings so you don't have to be scared to play it. And now we move on to the backside. There's some really freaky stuff in our control cavity. Per Adam Jones's spec, you have three CTS Gibson branded pots and then one DiMarzio 500K pot. That's the key to his tone. And then you got your giant orange drop capacitors. But what I found very strange is this pot is a long shaft. You see how it sticks up so far? They had to put a washer in there to space it out. Whereas all the other ones are short shafts. Were they just running out of parts that day? Or is that a specific spec? It changes something for Adam. <laughs> Who knows? But would you look at that? We do have space in here for another pot if you wanted it. Or you could move your toggle switch over here. But I would not suggest modifying one of these. It does beg to question though. Why bother? Why not just have a Les Paul style route rather than the SG one? Here's what your backplate looks like. But I would argue, I really like the look of this without the backplate on it. The reverse silver burst still continues. You've got the darkness here with just a little bit of silver on the edge. This black is not exactly the same hue and is a bit more reflective. And here's a peek on the other side of the toggle switch cavity. Here's a close up look at that medallion. I just love that golden hue. Previous medallions have always been more of like a silver color, but I don't believe this is necessarily special for this guitar, but it works incredibly well. Here's an up close look at the back side of the ferrules. Nothing necessarily too special if you're familiar with string through guitars like Telecasters. They're just little metal circles that stick up a little bit proud. As far as aging here, you've got a lot of finish checking in the silver area. And what I always thought kind of made it look weird and cheap in many stock photos is the fact that it didn't seem to continue into the black. It does continue all the way across. It's just harder to see. We'll just take a quick look around our sides here. It's a little bit chewed up and worn in in this area. And some more finish checking over here. It's really the VOS finish that kind of steals the show in a negative light, in my opinion. Wildwood had uh, sent me some photos. Here's your guitar. My first thought was, oh, VOS. <laughs> Specifically on the back. Now we need to talk a little bit more about the neck. Gibson has a bad habit of not putting the neck material in their detailed spec sheets. Sometimes you'll see it in like the description of the guitar, but this one, it didn't tell me. However, going to Toman's website, they list it as three pieces maple, which would make sense and line up with his Les Paul custom runs. And I totally believe that, but I wish Gibson would put it on their own site. It can be hard to preserve all these details if it's not directly from the source, because sometimes dealers get it wrong. Maybe I was all wrong about this guitar. The fact that it has the maple top, the fact that it has a maple neck, you don't ever find that on a Flying V, especially a 58 body style version. We also have a Volute on this one. That's another thing borrowed from his Les Paul Custom. Then we've got our Schaller M6 style tuners. That was the big popular thing in the 70s and 80s, and I really like these tuners. And our serial number on this one is AJ35. All said and done, this example weighs just a hair over seven pounds, seven pounds, 1.5 ounces. Now we talked about the COA earlier. It says it is built to reflect his preference for heavier guitars. So is anybody else fully expecting these things to be like 13, 14 pounds to like get really ridiculous with that? I don't know if that really matches that description. Cause I swear I saw somewhere that his prototype was like 13 pounds, but to be honest, it's probably more comfy this way, but let's go ahead and plug it in and hear how this version of the guitar sounds. First things first, I know why Adam wanted his to be heavy. 
Ah, it's a letdown. Neck heavy guitar. <laughs> It's not that bad when you're playing it. Like you're not excessively holding it up, but it is not perfectly balanced. <laughs> tool style stuff. These bridge pickups are always fantastic in these guitars. They're very, very extremely responsive. Like they go from a argument that the neck pickup just doesn't go anywhere near as hard. <laughs> it's still touch responsive, but just not as much. <laughs>
that bridge pickup really overdrives your amp. I mean, you're probably going to want to dial that down to at least seven. <laughs> thing it does clean up pretty good versus so I think the middle position like that might blend better Now let me know all about the Adam Jones Collector's Flying V. What are my honest final opinions? After buying it, playing it, seeing it in the flesh, all that good stuff. Do I think it's worth the 20 grand price tag? No. It's probably more of a seven to $10,000 guitar if we're being generous. You are paying twice as much to say, nana nana boo boo, I have one, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of what collecting is sometimes. This is going to be a very obscure piece of Gibson history. And to be honest, if you don't have version one already in your collection, there's no reason to buy this one first. It does pretty much the same stuff, but is just not traditional. This guitar is really for the super ultra Adam Jones fan that already has one of all the other versions or just somebody that wants something incredibly different because that's exactly what this does. It's incredibly different. Do I think these should have been ultra heavy to prevent the neck dive? Could we got a cooler case? Yeah, but shoulda, woulda, coulda, this is what it is. So you either like it or you don't. I will say though, this is not as weird looking in person. I, I don't necessarily agree with this placement. And by no means am I converted to this headstock, but it's not as freaky when you play it. So, Droglodytes, I hope you enjoy your new guitar knowledge. If you're interested in being the next owner of this one, you can find it for sale on my website, troglysguitarshow.com, and we will catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.